I can't think of a better way to start our time together than uh, to sing a song where we're asking that, that God would come and move uh, among us. And so uh, let's just, from, from that place, let's just enter into uh, uh, just a prayer and ask the Lord to do that. Holy Spirit, um, would you come and move? Father, we ask that you would release the gifts of your spirit here. That you would move among us, that we would know and feel your presence. I pray that that presence would fill us. And Father, all of the places that we have that are not given over to you, Father, would you come and knock on that door? Would you encourage us to open, allow you in? Would you move into that place? Push out all things that are not you in the name of Jesus. Fill it. Father, as we join the global church today in celebrating this season, would you help us to feel that connection? And so, Father, would you connect us to every body that is celebrating today? Would you connect us both near and far, those that we know and those that we don't? Would we together with one voice, worship the living God and celebrate that you broke into our reality because you love us. Would you be with us this morning in Jesus' name? Amen. Well, I don't want to start off by lying to you. That'll come later. Um, See, I'm learning to wait a little bit because then when you know that I've, I've made a joke, you know that the sympathy laugh needs to come afterwards, so I'm, I'm holding that tension for a moment to where you feel the tension, and then you laugh, and I feel better. Um, so that's how that, that, that works. Uh, but I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that uh, I, I try to stay a little uh, muted or understated um, during this season. Um, I do, you know, I, and, and in truth, though, this is a lot less than, than what I would do if I were in control of my life. Um, <laughs> But it's, you know, it's enough that there, there can be a little bit of compromise. I really believe that, that for me, the, I mean, honestly, I live in perpetual Advent. I am in the Advent season like year round. And, and it's, you know, for me, I don't understand people that, that even created the argument of when is too early to, to, to start to decorate for Christmas. Because I don't know that, I mean, that's like, is, is that even a question? But it just because I've, I've tried to, you know, I am, you know, this, this message of unity that, that we, we preach, um, I think that it's fair that if we're in a Burr month, then it's basically Christmas. So, you know, when we, when we go from, when we uh, move from August to September, if, if, that, if that month ends in Burr, it's Christmas time. So I feel like we are, we're, start, we're coming a little bit late to the party. So I've been asking for forgiveness and, and uh, you know, been praying on our behalf this whole week, you know, coming late to the Advent party. We are well into the Burr months, and we're just starting right now. Um, but this is, for me, and, and for a lot of folks across the, 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 the globe, would think of this as our New Year's Day. This is the beginning of a new year in the church calendar. As we, we celebrate Advent, we work towards Christmas and all things that, that then point to Resurrection Day that we'll celebrate together on March 31st, 2024. And, and then we wait Pentecost, and then we, uh, we have this time where we just get to build anticipation to do it all over again. Today is a day that we get to start doing it all over again, and that's pretty awesome. There is one Advent hymn that strikes with me that, that really, it, it lands, and, and I just, I want to start our Advent time together just with reading this. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. This familiar hymn reflects the prayers and the cries of the collective heart of the nation of Israel as they waited in expectation of Christ's first coming. Twelve centuries ago, the church began to sing this song to commemorate that first coming of the Savior of the world, and for us also, the expectation of his return 
that we wait to come. So this hymn is a hymn of hope. This hope comes from the reality of God's plan, both historical and future. We know that he saved his people from slavery in Egypt. He guided them through the Exodus. He brought them to the promised land. He showed them favor and faithfulness, even as they looked to other places for provision, relationship, and comfort. Still, God did what he promised. He came himself to save his people. This hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, written in 1710, but with origins that go back to the 8th century, in that same spirit today, we join churches across the world beginning the celebration of Advent. Four weeks, a four-week season that remembers the anticipated birth of Jesus and also defines our current reality that we are even now waiting for his return. The word Advent, what would it be without a, a, a language lesson as we add to our, our common tongue, this language of BBC-ish that we've been creating over time? Um, and honestly, I believe that I'm not the one that actually started uh, BBC-ish, you know, bringing a, a language here. I'm going to place that blame on the founding pastor of the church, who will remain nameless um, because he's just sitting over there. Um, <laughs> But really, Alan started it, and so I'm continuing it, but we're not going to point fingers. Um, That's right. (laughs) But this this comes from the Latin word adventus. And and this word, at at the basic level, means coming or arrival, appearance, emergence of a notable person or event. The nation of Israel was adventing a Messiah. They're waiting for the appearance, the emergence of a Savior, one that would come and make reconciliation between God and creation possible, but also that would save them from the captivity that they knew, both spiritual and political. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said that the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. So in other words... Advent is a celebration of the reality of hope coming to the former hopeless. Advent's a time where we celebrate that God loves us so much that he would send his son to be our rescue. That nothing but his love could soothe this troubled soul that Bonhoeffer talks about. Also, the idea of a collective troubled soul, the collective nation of Israel, but also us together now. With the knowledge of imperfections, crying out to God for something greater than what we have now, it allows us to, con- to connect not only to Bonhoeffer's quote, but that hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, as we advent Jesus. Now we know that the first advent season lasted for centuries. How many centuries depends on what event you utilize to to start the clock. For me, I think an easily defensible starting clock would be around 1655 BC, about 1600 years before Jesus would would be born. 1655 BC, the nation of Israel was was in captivity, held as slaves in Egypt, needing rescue from enslavement. That was the national reality. They needed God. That reality remained even after the exodus, after the escape with Moses, after entering the promised land. And from that point forward, this history of the nation of Israel is predicated on the need for salvation. The entire Testament, the Old Testament, shows us this need for salvation. Now, from a a secular viewpoint, save a little bit of time that that Israel enjoyed victory over opponents and occupation of the land that was promised to them, the remainder of history saw Israel under another nation's power. From a spiritual standpoint, the nation of Israel was separated from God 
due to the power of sin that captured at the individual level and also at the community level. The first advent ended with what we call Christmas, with the coming of Jesus, the reality that the kingdom of God broke into our realm with the birth of the Savior. This inbreaking was an incursion into the plight of humanity and yet another phase of the plan of God to bring reconciliation between creation and creator. Currently now, we as the church are engaged in the second advent as we wait for Jesus to do what we know that he will do. We know this. We know that he will do what he said that he will do because he's always done what he said that he will do. We know this because he's done it before. This allows the expectation to enter into a realm of hope. Hope is how we mark the first week of the Advent season. We are linked to the past in that we wait, but we also know that God does what he says that he will do because of the birth of Jesus. So the first Advent testifies, gives us hope for the second Advent. Hope also is linked to faith, but often, especially in the secular realm, the secular realm that, that needs a savior and needs this good news of what's available to us, hope is misunderstood as a wish. Often hope and wishful thinking are used interchangeably. In many contexts, when we say, I hope, we actually are talking about a wish and this dilutes the meaning of the word hope. You can tell it's at play when you hear somebody says, well, I hope this happens. Like, there's a lot of us today that are saying, I hope the Broncos win today. <laughs> there's not a lot predicated on that that actually, you know, that, 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 that is a wish. <laughs> it's wishful thinking, it's not hope. It's wishful thinking because it's predicated on something subjective. Hope is different than wishing. Hope is the confidence that by placing God's redemptive acts in the past alongside trusting human responses in the present, the faithful will experience the fullness of God's goodness both now in the present but also in the future to come. Responding to the knowledge that God does what he says that he will do, trusting him to continue to do what he says that he will do, all of this leads to confidence, and that confidence is the reality of hope, and it is a reason to celebrate. Biblical hope, Advent hope, rests on how trustworthy God is to keep his promises. Biblical hope is objective because it's founded on something that provides a sufficient basis for confidence and fulfillment. God and his redemptive acts throughout Scripture culminate in the birth, life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, that this is done for us and that this is all we need for relationship with God. The notion of hope is conveyed all through scripture, through a sense of expectation, expectation that sounds like the hymn that we, that, that we kind of started off with today. The message of the prophets of the Old Testament build this expectation for the first advent, just in, as, as Jesus in his teachings and the apostles in their theology convey expectation for the second advent. The prophet Isaiah some 650 to 700 years before the birth of Jesus, was given this prophecy. Captured in Isaiah 9. Never nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulon and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. 
For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and his people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as the people rejoice at the harvest, and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. It's a message of hope. Predicated on the objective reality that God has always done what he said that he will do. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. This message of hope transcends subjectful, subjective, wishful thinking. In that the same God that said that he would do all these things can be expected to continue with his track record. A Messiah would come. Rescue would come. Reconciliation with God would come. This message offers hope to the nation of Israel. While God uses his chosen people, the nation of Israel is a vehicle of reconciliation. Jesus is Messiah, not just for them. Jesus is a Messiah for all of us as well. Those that don't know they needed a Messiah often don't know that they need something, but they're chasing. Nonetheless, they're chasing something. They're chasing something to fill their life. They're looking for meaning. They know that something is lacking. They sense also a beckoning of something deeper. And so in Matthew chapter 2, the story goes like this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose. We've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked them, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said. For this is what the prophet wrote. This comes from the prophet Malachi. And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are not least among the, the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the, the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went, their, went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. These three wise men, in some translations, they call them magi or sages. They're, they're likely astrologers and, and magicians that, that provided kings and rulers a sense of comfort in their decision-making process. They would give a hope, a false hope, built on, on coincidence, built on chance, 
built on superstition, manipulation, looking for signs in the natural world. They would give these kings a warm and fuzzy covering, an avenue to wishful thinking as they helped make decisions based on flawed perceptions that, that came from, from their interpretation of the signs of the natural world. Now, we think about that being true then, but we also know that that continues to happen today. Wishful thinking is alive and well. Looking for signs in the natural world that, that then we can place some comfort in, this is, this is alive and well in the culture around us. It still occurs today. People look to signs of all kinds so they can get some sort of picture of what might occur, whether it's patterns of behavior in other people, patterns of their own behavior, patterns of, of the weather, even patterns of, of stars, all of this being a subjective foundation that creates a false hope. These three magi are about to be introduced to objective hope. But first, they're summoned by a king. King Herod is worried because any king would be a threat to his rule. And feeling this threat, he called the visiting magis together to get some information about what they knew. The narrative really is this. These astrologers, these folks looked to the skies for meaning and direction. This is what they did. They built all of, of their confidence off of a false subjective hope that came from the way that they would read the stars. Looking to the skies for meaning, looking to the skies for direction, they saw a star and they followed it. They, they saw this star rise and they knew that there was more to this particular star. What we can get from the context of their behavior, they're responding as though this star has authenticity and power that the other stars do not. This authentic authenticity and power, this objectivity, it made all of their, subject, their su subjective work pale in comparison. This star made every other star they were chasing counterfeit. Pretenders to true meaning, pretenders to true salvation. They knew from watching this star rise, they knew from fill, filling this authenticity and power, they knew that this king of the Jews was more than just a ruler of a given people, but also the answer to the very purpose of life. This is what made these men pack their treasures, cross over rough terrain, rough terrain that held hostile rulers and hostile people, travel for days following a distant star. They were looking for something. They were looking for a promise. They were looking for more than a promise. They were looking for a king. They were looking for more than a king. They were looking for the king. In essence, really, as they saw the star rise, they were called by a power, and they were committed to finding where that power emanated from. So the astrologers, these lifelong star chasers, find Jesus. And in Jesus, they find authentic power. That authentic power manifested in the love of the creator God. They found this baby. They found Jesus worthy of worship. And in that worship, they presented gifts that came from their great wealth, treasures that they had packed all the way from home. The Magi, though, when we look at their, at their gift, they're not purchasing anything with their wealth. 
There is not a transaction that is happening with this gift. This is worship. They are praising Jesus by giving him all that they had. Why would they do that? What would lead them to worship? Their praise is a result of of what they know is a new reality. One where hope can replace wishful thinking. The subjective can die to the objective. The stars that they had tracked all their life, the magic they had used, the superstitions that they had been taught, all of this stuff that they followed were wishes for comfort and covering. But with Jesus, a sure and confident expectation in God's love and faithfulness is possible, which brings comfort and covering. The nation of Israel was waiting for a Messiah during this first advent. But so too, whether they knew it or not, was the rest of the world. While the nation of Israel would receive their wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, the savior would be a savior to all. So as we begin our first week of Advent together, we can start today by evaluating where hope and wishful thinking impact our lives and the lives around us. Where confident expectation and wishful thinking collide. The question then is, do we have confident expectation in the love of God? Do we have confident expectation that what we read in scripture is is true, is real? Do we have confident expectation that in our separation from God, Jesus is enough to close the gap? Do we have confident expectation that Jesus is enough or Are we wishing for something based on something that we can control, something subjective, something that we can work out, something that we can manage that might provide relief, comfort, and provision? As we evaluate that in ourselves, as we ask the question, Do we have a confident expectation that Jesus will do what Jesus says that he will do? Maybe the most meaningful way to celebrate Advent is to be aware of all of those that we meet in the time between the Sundays that that toil in the realm of wishes. We are surrounded in the time between the Sundays of those that are toiling in this realm, that are wishing for something. Those that that are so longing for an objective foundation of hope that they are looking for signs in all kinds of places. Think of those that need to see a star that beckons them to more. Think of those that need that crave, that cry out for a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace. For those people, for those that we encounter, for those that we know, for those that are even entering our mind's eye right now, we can use this Advent season to show them a star to proclaim to them that for us and for them, a Savior is born, worthy of confident expectation. Would you pray with me?
Holy Spirit, would you meet us in this place of confident expectation? I pray, Father, as we evaluate our heart towards you, would you help us with all of the, the doubt, all of the places where we question, all of the places where we don't feel like we know you are there. And so, Father, even if you would come now and, and show us times in the, in the last week, the last month, the last year, this last piece of time where we felt isolated and alone, where we had wishful thinking, where we could not apply confident expectation that you would do what you say that you will do. Would you come and meet us in each of those places? And Father, for those of us that, that struggle with knowing your love for us, would you come and demonstrate it to us? I'm going to invite the, the prayer team to come forward. And as we return to worship, I would encourage you uh, to just to, to think this through about our confident hope. Think it through from the standpoint of, of what is subjective and what is objective. If there is anything that you would like to deal with the Lord, we'll have folks up here to pray with anything from, from healing to even asking or answering the question of where we place our hope. And so as we return to worship, we will uh, we'll be here to pray as well.